Hello and welcome to the TOA 16 studio. My name is Benjamin and I'm going to talk with Professor David Pöppel, who is a professor on psychology and neuroscience at NYU and also a scientific director at Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt. Welcome. Thank you. So David, you just gave a fascinating talk on some of your research in neuroscience. Uh, for those uh, who missed it, what was the key message? Um, I tried to convey sort of new directions that neuroscience might be going in. And one is that, as you know, not just neuroscience, but experimental work on uh, perception or you know, psychology in general is very lab-based. So we take you, we put you in a lab, maybe in a studio like this in one of these buildings, and maybe you're wearing headphones and you're listening to little beeps and boops, and then we interpret that. And that's been a very uh, productive tradition of research for 2,000 years. Uh, that's sort of the way of the natural sciences. And what I tried to give uh, two examples for is kind of new and uh, fun directions of research. Um, one in the direction of you know, the kind of materials we use, not just sine waves or gratings in a video, but I showed the example of screams. Screams are a very effective and emotional signal, and we've done some research on that and shows how, um, how quickly and compellingly screams, whether they're fear screams, alarm screams, or positive screams, kind of hijack the mind and brain to attend. So that was an example of going, moving towards naturalistic information. Um, the other message was to say, well, of course, we typically bring individual participants into a lab and study them, and it's been very, you know, a productive research program. But what we really would like to know is how do things work you know, in the wild, as the case may be, so in, under ecological conditions. So we're having a conversation, or we may be going to Mittag essen. Uh, so how does how does brain um, activate or how, how does the brain form the basis for natural behavior? And I tried to show that on some kind of more fun, playful example on how brains can synchronize. You can measure how you and I might be synchronized and how that synchrony goes up and down as a function of how we might be attending to some stimulus or not. Mm -hmm. So those are new directions in research. And my message, to some extent, is these are opportunities for new kinds of neuroscience, while not giving up on what I consider the absolute necessity of being pedantic, meticulous, careful, and methodical. That's the kind of tension. So I really like this idea of moving from the, from the solo brain to the social brain, mm -hmm. as you called it, yeah. so um, to, to research it in the wild. So yeah. is neuroscience something that can benefit from something like crowdsourced information? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, there should be no limits, right? So if we feel that there are limits of this kind, I would call them a poverty of the imagination. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the question is, can you ask a meaningful question about brain function by using crowdsourcing? So, in fact, our own experiment on, uh, that we recently did in a school in New York was exactly this kind of crowdsourcing. That is, we equipped an entire classroom for an entire semester with um, you know, electroencephalography, brain recording devices, and recorded them with the initial idea of just that the, um, we would be getting data from a crowd, so much more data and social data. But what I failed to understand until much later was the very exciting aspect that there's a, a, a different notion of crowdsourcing, namely that the crowd itself, in this case students, were participants in the research. That is, they weren't just the kind of passive recipients of an experiment that we brought to the classroom. They had to learn how to do it, put the, uh, the equipment on each other, learn how to record. So they became a crowd contributing as experimentalists and contributing as uh, subjects or participants. So I think there are great opportunities it's simply a question of kind of the, you know, a word that I use probably too often, the granularity of the question. Do you write, find the right Körnigkeit mm -hmm. of serious question that can be answered productively in this kind of crowdsourced way? But I think it's exciting, it's fun, but it's a huge technological challenge. Right. You also did this live experiment yes. uh, where people had these kind of headsets on yes. that were measuring brain waves. Yeah. Your research, I guess, neuroscience in general, is very technology-driven. Yes. So are there interesting technological developments in your field? Uh, yes and no. There are always, of course, everything is very technology-driven. So let me give a cautionary note because I'm, yeah. So on the one hand, we have amazing tools. So in the last 25 years, human neuroscience has been completely revolutionized, and that's been through the development and existence of uh, non-invasive recording devices. So all you know, you've taken an MRI, for instance, or you know, it used to be PET scanners, MRI scanners, MEG scanners, EEG scanners, and so on. So there's a kind of armamentarium of, of uh, wonderful techniques, and that's been really a game changer because you can watch, you can investigate individual people while they're doing something, and you can watch the brain work. So that's great. 
And over the years, the spatial resolution of these cameras, if you will, has gotten very good, right? So it's on the order of one millimeter. So I can have a device that's over here, and I can take a picture inside your brain with a resolution of one millimeter. That's kind of cool, right? I mean, you have to. Um, other complementary techniques of uh, the appropriate temporal resolution. So we can record millisecond by millisecond. And of course, what we want is we want to record from the whole, and the whole brain's only this big, right? So put two fists together. But in this little, uh, you know, in this little chunk, there are 86 billion cells. So that's a lot of cells. And that's, uh, you know, about as many cells as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So that's a big number. Each of these cells is connected. So we can record with high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution, and technology goes all the time. Here's the rub. We are not advancing at the same degree with what I prefer to call conceptual resolution. So we have good spatial resolution, temporal resolution, but our ideas are lagging behind. Okay. So we have good engineering and mathematics, you know, kind of analytic techniques, but are we asking the right questions? So it's, I think it's actually up to philosophers, linguists, psychologists to help guide what is the right kind of question that can even be answered at the moment. Uh, your institute in Frankfurt is called the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics, mm -hmm. which is kind of a funny term because these two terms usually don't go together because Absolutely. aesthetics is a, a topic for philosophy yes. traditionally, mm -hmm. and you're doing neuroscience, like hard science research yes. on it. So is your work very interdisciplinary there? Uh, yeah, our work is kind of um, relentlessly interdisciplinary okay. and dangerously so. So the institute has, um, and it's a wonderful, bold initiative by the Max Planck Society to try something uh, really, you know, crazy, although not lunatic. Um, the, we have a department of music, a department of language and literature, and a department of neuroscience. And of it's, so it's explicitly designed to have um, humanities experts speak to you know, experimental psychologists, systems neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, computational people, and so on. But the premise really is down, it goes back to um, a very, you know, it's in some sense a premise that was developed by Fechner, so Fechner in the 19th, middle of the 19th century wrote a foundational text about how to study perception in the mind called uh, Elemente der Psychophysik. So can you use the principles of the natural sciences, basically quantification, careful methodical experimentation to study mental phenomena? Very influential book and still to this day kind of one of the you know, original texts of how to do experimental work. Interestingly, Fechner, who was himself a very odd man, um, ten years later, wrote a book called Grundzüge einer empirischen Ästhetik, so an uh, empirical aesthetics foundational text. And what so he it said, is an older, so an it older is actually term. an older tradition. It's an old German tradition. But the interesting thing, and that he got right, is that you you should use the methods of the science to study something as odd as why do I like something? Why do I like this movie and not that one? Why am I moved by this poem and not that? Why do I want to move? You know to the beat of this particular song, but I find completely horrible that other song. And the, so the premise is you can use the techniques of the natural sciences and the humanities in an integrated way to study something as ostensibly abstract and abstruse even as the experience of aesthetic phenomena. Right. At the end of your talk, you also reached out to the tech community yes. because we're at TOA, of course, and the yeah. whole startup community from Berlin is here. Right. So you see a great potential for startups in the field of neuroscience? Absolutely. I mean, I think that neuroscience is extremely receptive. But well, first of all, a meeting like this has the advantage of, you know, I feel like I'm the oldest guy here, right? So I walked around, I grabbed a coffee, I grabbed a Brezen, I grabbed a, you know, apparently everyone here drinks Red Bull. Um, the, that's cool. <laughs> um, but it's, it's sort of a young and energetic crowd, which is always good, but it seems to be animated by kind of the spirit of risk-taking. And what neuroscience needs is that. I mean, so first of all, uh, you need technologies that are you know, innovative and you don't know what the application is going to be. So one of the great things about the Max Planck Society is it's a commitment to basic research. All right, so the, the a credo of the society, a, a, a famous sentence by Max Planck is, dem Anwenden muss das Erkennen vorangehen. So application needs to be preceded by basic insight. Mm -hmm. And the, but to get, we don't know what the answer is going to be yet. There's no product, right? There's no dongle, no application in neuroscience. We, we only know it once we've gotten there. So what's a transformative technology and a transformative insight is easy to say in hindsight. Uh, you just don't know. So I think there are tremendous opportunities for development of devices, interfaces, software, you know, at, at any level of technological development 
there are huge opportunities. And remember, the human brain is one of the great frontiers of science now. So if the two frontiers are the structure of the universe and the structure and function of the human brain. Thanks, and that's really fascinating. Um, one very quick last question. Yeah. As a professor, you travel to a lot of conferences. Yeah. So how does TOA compare to all the other academic conferences? Um, well, it's, I have to say, much more fun. <laughs> and, and of course, it's focused on a particular, you know, the topics of technology and um, the food is um, more plentiful and better. It's not uh, cheese cubes, which I appreciate. Uh, it's not cheese cubes and cheese, cheap red wine. It's Red Bull and uh, healthy organic food. Um, but I think that's the spirit of, you know, the sort of young, the, the relentless drive towards innovation is what makes it exciting and fun. And I think that there, again, it would be a, sh it would be a missed opportunity for this conference not to connect to neuroscience in a more systematically way and see what an opportunity this is. I mean, not just to serve product placement, but to think creatively and uh, without boundaries and boldly, to have the courage, embrace the courage of your convictions and do something you didn't anticipate before. So. Great. David, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Great to have you. And have a great conference. Thank you so much.